fellow FNAF fans. Ever since the Five Nights at Freddy's movie came out, people have pretty quickly uncovered the lore, as always. It's actually pretty interesting to see what theories have come out of this film that people are talking about. However, one of these sticks out to me like a sore thumb, and yet not many theorists out there have really dived deep into this theory besides me and a couple of my friends. Is Mike Schmidt still Michael Afton in the film universe? Considering this was the first thing that I wanted to research once the film debuted, I made a full 19 page doc on it that a lot of people have seen and have given pretty positive reception. However, the people who don't believe Mike Schmidt is an Afton likely haven't seen the evidence, and let me be clear, it is damning. Anyway, enough intro stuff, let's start diving into this theory. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and let's get right into it. Now before we start, I should probably show you guys this scene. I am just trying to figure out who you are, Mr. Michael Sh mm. Coffee? Clearly, we can see that William has some sort of relationship with Mike. The question is how? Well, I'm gonna tell you right here. It's because it's his son. Now, before we continue this video, I should probably delay the groundwork with the other explanation that many people give regarding this encounter. That Mike is an Emily child, aka the child of Henry in the film universe. I obviously disagree with this, but let me quickly explain some reasons why I think this is false. First, the training tape. Some people claim that this guy in the training tape working on the endo is Henry, and it looks like the guy in Mike's flashback to Garrett's kidnap. I would say on the surface level this is decent evidence, however what people don't regard is that Mike has a clear view of this dude in the video and has no reaction at all. You'd think that if he saw his father making an endo in the video of a place that you've never heard about, he'd have a minor reaction, but nope. The only thing he has is a teeny tiny minor squint that I really don't see meaning literally anything. After that, everything regarding Mike being an Emily child completely falls apart. Considering that he knows literally nothing about Freddy Fazer's Pizza, something that Henry would have probably told him about, is kind of vital. The fact that timeline-wise Garrett gets kidnapped in 1987 and Mike is 12, he would be 8 when his father is still working at Freddy's, which really doesn't make sense if he remembers nothing from there. There's also some behind the scenes footage to suggest that Freddy's opened in 1979, but that still makes Mike four years old and I find it really hard to believe that he simply just forgot about the place. Plus, a lot of the assumptions about Mike being an Emily child heavily relies on Garrett being the puppet, which I have already explained in a previous video I don't believe due to the mere existence of Ella, which means that Charlie does probably exist in the movie universe if Ella is being created as a Springlock animatronic. And if so, Mike, Garrett, and Abby have had a sister named Charlie, which no one has a recollection of at all. We also know that the MCI happens 1987 in the movie-verse, aka the same year that Garrett gets kidnapped. Some people say the Sammy kidnapping seems to parallel Garrett's kidnapping, where shortly after William then kills both of the siblings, causing trauma onto one of the Emily children. For the novels, it's Charlie, and for the movies, it's Mike. But this doesn't seem to line up with pretty much anything other than that. First of all, Garrett was kidnapped in 1987, and Sammy was kidnapped in 1982. In the novels, Sammy has pretty much no relation to the missing kids in the slightest, or in the films, it is pretty damn clear that Garrett is present in some way or another, whether he is the puppet, Golden Freddy, or simply someone else. Not that much lines up. Anyway, with that out of the way, Mike being an Emily child is frankly really hard to justify when you dig a little deeper. Being an Afton child, on the other hand, is honestly really easy. Based on some novel information, we learn that Mike is 25 years old and Vanessa is either the same age or slightly younger. With this information, we can gather a hypothesis on on what happens early on in Mike's life. Let's assume that Mike's mother was married to William and she had Mike specifically with William, making Mike an Afton child. However, due to the fact that William is a piece of shit, she decides to leave him with the child, probably winning custody. William would then remarry a different woman, having Vanessa, or maybe even having Vanessa with Mike's mom, and she completely abandoning her. This gives Mike, Mike's mom no recollection of Freddy's at all when marrying a new guy, and Vanessa would be born the exact year Freddy's opens, based off of some behind the scenes with YouTubers who visited the set. And yeah, unfortunately this would make Garrett not an Afton and purely a Schmidt kid as well as Abby, however this was something I assumed from the get-go, as if Garrett was still an Afton child in the movie universe, it would make Mike 8 years old when William left them, which is really unbelievable. 
And I know that this was not something that was overlooked or anything like that, because take a look at the car. It has no license plate, meaning it was a used car planned for that area in the woods, meaning Afton couldn't have driven all the way from Minnesota to Nebraska, and he likely took a plane. Uh, excuse me? You're taking a plane to kidnap a random child? I did some further analysis in my document on this exact topic, but based off of the poster that there is, they are visiting Housie National Forest, which is literally in the smack dab middle of Nebraska. And if you want to even take this added little bonus seriously, there's a different national forest in Sioux County, which is even farther. This alone proves that the Schmidt family has some sort of relationship with William. And if there's a planned attempt for this specific kidnap, as well as an image in the credits hinting at William clearly getting a plane ticket for Nebraska, likely to have so uh, the least amount of suspicions, this means that the entire trip to Nebraska was likely some sort of setup. And before any of you comment on it, no, the Visit Nebraska poster is not just to help Mike get into the scenery setting, because again, William has no license plate in this kidnapping, and based off of the emphasis on a plane as well as the transition into the poster, it really seems unlikely that Emma or Scott would make a transition like that for us to just assume that it's a random place in Minnesota. Now with these two things set up, everything else really starts falling into place. For example, the clear emphasis on Mike Dreamer throughout this movie. It is so strange to me that if this is just a random Schmidt guy, that the massive lore emphasis they put on this movie is dreams which arguably confirms Mike Dreamer in the games. There's a lot of theories revolving around them, but at the beginning of the film, Jeremiah says this. And though the dreamer remains asleep, he walks through memory as if experiencing it for the first time anew, no longer a passenger, but an active participant. And it's interesting how we could so easily apply this to FNAF 4, not just in terms of gameplay, but in the minigames as well. It could very much be possible that the FNAF 4 minigames is intentionally Mike dreaming about the guilt of his brother, hence why each night seems to play into one another. After the Mike Foxy jump scare with the bite victim, it summons Nightmare Foxy, or how Nightmare Fredbear specifically appears after and before the death of the crying child at the hands of Fredbear. And there's one massive thing that strings all this together, the sleeping pills. Something from FNAF 4 that always bothered me was the pill bottle Easter egg. But if this was for someone in a coma dying after being bitten, what good would pills do for the bite victim in the hospital? His face was just crushed. They could be painkillers, sure, but if he's in a coma, why would he even need painkillers? Well, if we apply these Easter eggs to Mike part in particular for FNAF 4, it actually makes a lot of coherent sense. These flowers are there to represent his sorrow for the incident, and the IV bag is there to represent his guilt. But the pills are there for a different reason. It's there to represent Mike wanting to go back and change the incident, stopping it from happening. This isn't what I asked for. That's what you want? No. I just, I just want to find the man that- You're lying. You want to save Garrett. That's why you're really here. To change what happened. To go back. This is, of course, if you apply this line to FNAF 4, which it really does make a lot of sense to do so. Basically what I'm saying is that Mike's relationships to dreams in the film is almost one for one with what happens in the games. Guilt over the death of his brother, potentially a ghost that's causing him to experience these vivid nightmares. For the film universe, it would be Garrett, and for the game universe, it would be the bite victim. But this is really all thrown out if he isn't an Afton kid. There is no point to compare these two if they don't have the same family lineage, because that means that the characters themselves are not comparable in the slightest, which quite literally is the opposite from what's happening here. We also learn from these dreams that Mike experiences physical injury from the ghosts. You're bleeding, by the way. Nasty. And as for the nice little cherry on top of connections to Mike Dreamer in FNAF 4, we have the song Talking In Your Sleep. This song literally emphasizes dreams and being able to hear them as bystanders. This is sung by Freddy's band throughout the whole movie, which is a very clear nod to how the MCI kids are always in his dream when he's at Freddy's. And of course, this song was released in 1983. Coincidence? I think not. Now, is Garrett's kidnap in the film's 1983? No, it actually isn't, although he was born in 1983. However, it is in 1987, just like how the MCI is set in 1987 in the film universe as well, especially if we are going to learn from his past in the second film, which is a sequel. 
And I haven't really said this before on the channel, but I count Abby and Garrett as half Aftons, seemingly fulfilling a form of the fates of the two Afton children in the games. Garrett would be bitten in 1987 instead of 1983 in the film universe, and Abby was attempted to be killed by the Ella Springlocks in the film universe, which obviously isn't baby, but it could very much be a subtle nod to Elizabeth's death in the game universe. Her name is also an anagram for baby, which I really cannot believe is a coincidence. My extreme connection also connects something else to FNAF 4. After Bite Victim gets bitten and is in the hospital bed, Mike says, can you hear me? I don't know if you can hear me, I'm sorry. And what does he say to Vanessa? Vanessa, I don't know if you can hear any of this, but um, I'm having a hard time just processing everything that happened. So we have Mike talking to a sibling in a hospital bed after an injury relating back to Afton with extremely similar dialogue and an IV bag blatantly obviously present. I'm sorry, this is a clear slam dunk. Also, three Easter eggs that you can miss regarding Mike's Afton hood if you aren't paying attention. First, the sun clock. It obviously isn't identical to the sister location sun clock, but it is a pretty clear callback. There's also the alarm clock beeping at the beginning of the movie, where each timer fades in at almost the same rate, lasts about 10 seconds, and comes to a complete stop. The similarities between the end of the FNAF 4 Nights and this are quite literally almost identical. During Mike's interview, there's also a pretty clear opposite nature between the two. Mike is wearing a dark suit with a yellow tie, and William is wearing a yellow suit with a dark tie. In the games, Mike is the protagonist and William is the antagonist, aka the opposites. Is that here? Well, looks like it. And of course, there's an identical line connection between Mike and Vanessa in their respective encounters with Afton. And you only have to worry about one thing keeping people out and and you know and keep the place tidy that's two things you had one job one keep him in the dark and kill him if he got too close that's two jobs so in conclusion is mike and afton in the film universe yes i think so if you want to check it out i also go a little bit more in depth in a document i made regarding this topic and the link to it will be in the description but anyways guys, thank you all so much for watching this video. More content coming soon, and stay tuned for the day Help Wanted 2 comes out, because I'll definitely be making my thoughts on it after the releases. I hope you all have a great rest of your day, and as always, peace out.